So tell us a bit about your t-shirt, Dave. Uh, <laughs> it's great. I'm super happy to have it. Uh, I've been longing for a hammer uh, for a hammer horror shirt, but they're like thirty bucks. Like t-shirts are like thirty bucks now. So mm. I was not going to yeah. spend thirty dollars on a t-shirt, but I will definitely spend ten dollars at the grocery store. You know? Do we know who owns the rights of all that stuff now? Uh, Hammer's Universal. I don't know what they. Is I mean, it Universal? The, the old, like the at least the the rights to the the older films that that goes yeah. to Universal and Warner Brothers. I think. Um, I'm not sure who owns the merch rights. Um, Probably Universal. Who, I doubt that they let yeah. that go. Yeah. Um, because there is. I mean, they do. Hammer still exists. Like John Gore, mm -hmm. he's a um, he's like a Broadway producer, and he. Uh, if you look at their website, it's, you know, hammer a John Gore, whatever, um, John Gore production or something. But so, and they did that Eddie Izzard movie. Was that last year? Uh, like a remake of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but with Eddie mm -hmm. Izzard. Um, I didn't, I didn't, and, that, I missed that one. Yeah. They're starting to try to yeah, relaunch. I, I think that. Amicus too. Amicus, uh, the rights to Amicus got bought by some guy and they're trying to, to re revamp uh, Amicus, Amicus is, as well. Uh, we need Tygon to be reborn. There's the three, the big yeah. three were yeah, Hammer, exactly. Hammer, Amicus, and Tygon. Um, but like, if you wanted boobs, you went for Hammer. If you wanted, um, <laughs> like, <laughs> if you wanted more kind of gore, you went for Amicus, and they did a lot of portmanteaus. Yeah. But then Tygon were the kind of wild card. You've got like um, uh, Blood and Satan's Claw, which is I love oh, that yeah. film so much. It's yeah, the, yeah. I just I just bought the 4K remaster of that, and it's <laughs> absolutely brilliant. It's a uh, yeah, I love that. In fact, Mark, who I did the other podcast with, and I went to um, the location. We found the, you know, if you, there's like... The, oh, that's right. Yeah, you showed um, us. Yeah. the the Yeah, uh, yeah. That's awesome. It, like an old abbey that's like ruin, in ruins. But yeah, it's, it, it's uh, yeah, so we went on a, on a kind of quest to find it. But we've done Hammer locations as well. I love Hammer Horror. It's, uh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's so uh, good. And I love like the fact that um, it's so like the the settings are so essential to the movies, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and it's just so, and the universe, like uh, all of those, the big studio like horror or or independent, you know, independent D horror, like they oftentimes just reused sets, right? Like yeah. mm -hmm. that was really common, but like in Hammer, um, it has this different kind of feeling to it where, you know, the sets and the actors, right? You've got like Peter Cushing, who's in the in the Dracula series, uh, he plays Van Helsing, but then he also plays like like other people who are vampire right. hunters that aren't right. Van Helsing, you know. But it all works, and it almost has this kind of like mm -hmm. multi universe, you know what I mean, like multi dimensional aspect to it, like where he's like, yeah, I don't know. It just has this really, it's like this layered feeling to the films when you watch them, watch them all through. When I did that, um, the UFO and horror course with uh, Diana Pasalka, um, I went through and was just like watching like just tons of horror um to get into the that mindset and uh but and to re-get into it because i in college and stuff i just i was just saturated in in horror films but then i got i got like sensitive where i couldn't watch <laughs> like, you know like like i couldn't put on a dario film it was just anything with gore and stuff i was just like oh, i can't do it like life's too real you know mm -hmm. um but mm -hmm. for whatever reason like when i was doing this class like my filters were back up and i could watch all that stuff again so i went in a, a big deep dive and really fell in love with hammer i'd always been like universal had been my like the thing that i you know like my my keystone of like the horror stuff but once i watched the hammer stuff i i don't know i watch universal now and i still enjoy it but the hammer things are really where it's at the hammer stuff seemed I, like more, more natural light yeah and, yep. and, and stage lighting yeah yeah, yeah and and a lot of just you could, tell, you could tell the sets were actually real buildings and real yeah places. yeah exactly yeah. Yeah. yeah and just like the and the, the reframing too like the way that they you know early on there was the um universal hammer when hammer came out with uh i think frankenstein was that the first one that they did um and universal had first horror they did yeah yeah and and universal had told them like you can you can use Frankenstein, but you can't use anything that in any way looks like Universal. We'll sue you and we'll, we'll, you know, shut it down. Right. So um, they 
the the way that they reframe things that you're used to from the way that Universal really like took over that mythology, you know, right, right. Um, like the Hammer Frankenstein's all focus on Frankenstein, like Doctor Frankenstein, and uh, he's a he's like this sociopathic, <laughs> like completely right, right, amoral, you know, like he still <laughs> has like, but he still has humanity to him to some extent, right? right like he's not. Right. He's he's amoral. He'll, he's willing to kill like to make his like scientific work progress, but at the same time, he still has like this care for the for the monster for the creature that he creates and like right um, and the different twists that they did. It's just it's incredible and it really like I really like the Frankenstein ones because if you think about the time period they're made like late fifties like into the sixties and that um, there's this weird parallel between the Frankenstein characters amorality and stuff like MK Ultra and that you know and like these these tests that were going on and the kind of experiment human experimentation that was happening mm -hmm. um you get this amazing reflection which you don't get in the universal ones right like you it's more fantasy based and more kind of um it's not quite as contemporary you know and I love the fact that Hammer's able to do that with their films where it has this kind of contemporary philosophy behind it and it explores that through these uh you know classic monster characters Universal was going for more of a jump scare effect I think yeah because they, yeah, they and... also also if you look at like like the way they the what they turned that story like look at the Shelley story right and then look at what they turned the monster into. The monster right. was not a brutish oaf. No, no, yeah, he was yeah. a philosophical. Yeah, he was, exactly. Yeah, yeah, was, yeah And his yeah. name was Adam. You know, he yeah, was the, exactly. the first creation yeah, yeah. of man. Yeah, I mean, but he had depth of character. Yeah, which and they then, bring out a little bit in Hammer. You know, it, yeah, it's exactly. The, the, That's what I'm Frank saying. But universally, yeah, yeah. it was like, ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was like really bad. If you, if you read the book and then saw the, the movie, you're like, what? Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, and it's interesting, too, because like Dracula, when Dracula came out, uh, the Universal Dracula, it was billed as a romance. It actually came out on Valentine's Day mm -hmm. because um, mm -hmm. and that's the interesting kind of like development of horror as a genre. You know, horror, as we know, it didn't exist until like the late 70s as like a thing. Like we will make a horror movie, you know, up into that point, it was like chillers, thrillers. You could intermix right. mm -hmm. like a crime drama with like, uh, you know, a supernatural thriller or something but the idea of horror like we know it now did not it didn't exist it was used right like horror show there were terms like that but it was really like Stephen King and uh the the beginning of the literary horror um and then Stephen King got you know he sold his movie rights quickly and got those you know like I don't forget what the was it Salem's Lot I don't know what the carry right like the these things that like just came out and sort of defined the the horror genre as horror um you know and hammer exists prior to that universal exists prior to that so the the universal ones were gothic you know they're supposed to be kind of like mm -hmm. gothic melodramas and then yeah. hammer comes out with... most of most of hammer was wasn't it i mean hammer was very yeah, gothic very much so um, yeah yeah and then you had like it sort of became a time went by it sort of started to get more sleazy and a bit more psychedelic <laughs> yeah. which is yeah which yeah. is yeah. great but Especially, yeah, I mean, they, we were talking about it earlier, the Dracula, the last few Draculas in particular, oh AD my God, 72 yeah. and Satanic Rites. Uh, I mean, it's they're kind of groovy 60s sort of sleaze. Yeah. Films, aren't <laughs> that's, um, well, that's, well, that's, I mean, that, that's how I got exposed to Hammer was like when I was a kid, there was a, like this would have been early 70s. And um, there was a theater in my neighborhood that on Saturday you could see three second run movies, I guess you would call them. For 75 mm -hmm. cents and so that's where we'd spend our saturdays is like sitting watching like whatever they showed we didn't care yeah. <laughs> three <laughs> movies for 75 cents we were going <laughs> and it was always like weird grindhouse stuff hammer stuff a lot of hammer stuff yeah and like mm -hmm. and a lot of that weird that, that was the same time like the weird exploitation stuff started coming mm -hmm. out like blackula barren yep. blood all yep. that kind of like weird stuff <laughs> and then and then there'd be a weird a bruce lee movie Right, it's like right, like the three things you see, like a couple of weird horror genre films, and then a Bruce Lee film, which at that time, you know, it was kind of relatively new, the Bruce Lee thing. Right, it's interesting because yeah, it's kind of Bruce Lee and The Exorcist were the two kind of things that really killed Hammer, weirdly, weren't they? I mean, you had uh, The Exorcist came out, and they tried to kind of copy it or copy the sort of vibe of it with um, uh, To the Devil a Daughter. 
Yeah. Um, and then and then obviously Bruce Lee became huge, so they tried to do like the kung fu vampire film and which i, um, I mean that one's great though like that one's so good <laughs> i know that people don't like it but it's so good like it's just if you can if you could just like exist with the characters and not and that, you know that's well that's what I, you have to do with that yeah, stuff is you have to like shut up and, and like relax and eat your yeah. popcorn and just let it go like yeah just let it happen you. I mean, it's, yeah 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 and exactly it's, fun. it's like and a roller coaster it's like yeah. There was the trilogy they did as well. The a Constein trilogy, I think it's called, where it's like um, oh, that Twins of great. Evil, yeah. Lust for a Vampire, and what's yeah. the other one? Um, there's three of them. But Lust for a Vampire, uh, I remember that was one of the first ones I saw yeah. as a kid, and I was like, oh my god, it's like it's like horror, but it's slightly, <laughs> it's a bit like porn. It's a bit like, yeah, it's exactly. like what the hell's going exactly. on? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a like, super weird. Well, and there's uh, the Captain yeah. Kronos. I think Captain yeah. Kronos is like loosely related to the, the Karnstein trilogy. Um, it's like yeah. the fourth one in the trilogy. I forget what the third one is, but it's and a lot yeah, of that I mean, stuff was, was R rated when yeah. I was, yeah. Twins I remember like the, the guy Twins who owned the so Commodore funny. Theater, like he'd take our money and he wouldn't look at us because <laughs> we were clearly not 17, yeah. we were like mm. 12, 13. He just like looked the other way when he took our money and we just go in. <laughs> he just fantastic. wanted the money, he didn't care. Yeah, that's just you and, know. And we were going to see tits. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> well, and it's it's interesting. Arguably, too, though, Amicus was kind of better though, wasn't it? In a way, <laughs> I thought Amicus they kind of they had like more of an edge to them that I really liked. Yeah, they. Yeah. Well, like it, it's interesting, but they also the weird thing about Amicus though they did humor too. Like there was like humor mm -hmm. elements, like um, the house that dripped blood, uh, which which is interesting. That two of the there's the tales from the crypt one. Um, and then there's the house that dripped blood. I know the house that dripped blood was all Robert Block. Like every story in mm -hmm. there, like every little vignette was was a, based on a short story by Robert Block. And then I'm not sure about the um, the other one, but doesn't Robert had, Block have some connection to Lovecraft? Yeah, Isn't there some yeah, he was in the yeah. he was he was a young uh, weird tales writer, and then became big with Psycho. And he did he actually wrote for Star Trek and. And a bunch of stuff but, but was he one of the writers like the letter correspondence people with yep. with love yeah like, yeah but he was like a kid some, like yeah yeah but there was some kind of i can't remember what it was i think we interviewed a guy julian simpson who does the lovecraft investigations show mm -hmm. on bbc and robert block came up in that i can't remember maybe it was um is it the haunter in the dark? one of the books i think block wrote an unofficial well like a sort of um a sort of sequel to it with Lovecraft's Blessing, I think. It's something like oh, that. Okay. One of his love love stories, I'm sure it's Block. He wrote a like a kind of official, unofficial sequel. I oh to, yeah, I yeah, yeah. I think I think you're I think you're right. I'm I sure it's Block. Call reading yeah. something about that, yeah. Yeah, and he drew yeah. too. He has some there's if you if you Google Robert Block and Lovecraft, he's got some like cool um just real amateur but wonderful drawings. Uh, based on the Lovecraft stuff, and it's interesting. Then he moves into like Psycho, and like really like because uh, Psycho is like a beautifully paced book. It's actually like really well written in the in structurally, you know, in the way that he he uses kind of like you don't quite know what's going on, and the way he paces it and frames it, and like has you know, uh, it's really well written. Which is uh, yeah, maybe. Partially because at that point he was writing screenplays as well. Um, you know, he was doing stuff for Star Trek and, and some other things. So, but yeah, it's it's amazing the the spread that Lovecraft had his influence on all these different writers that come out. You know, oh, yeah. and no, well, I mean, and that's, and that's the thing people that's the thing people miss about the Lovecraft stuff is that it's not about monsters. No, no, uh -uh. It's, it's about the horror of the mind. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that's that's a, that's the cool thing because like if you look at like Psycho. Like it has that element to it, you know. You can almost well, that's, see that's why I was pointing that out. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. yeah, because that's there's no monsters in that, but there are. Right. Yeah. Right. Hmm. There's definitely monsters, yeah. but like of a different kind. What's interesting about Lovecraft is he's a great storyteller, but he's not actually a very good writer. If you notice that, like, if you actually read what he writes, yeah, the way yeah. he yeah. the way he writes is very root one, isn't it? It's kind of very he loves loves reusing certain terms like eldritch. He always uses eldritch yeah. for everything. It was a, a gibbon yeah. moon and all this kind of stuff. You know, he just like yeah. some of his story, his um some of his uh 
storytelling devices are really funny as well. Like, you know, it's coming up the stairs. It's, you know, <laughs> there's a guy writing yeah. a diary entry of whilst there's a monster coming up the stairs again. <laughs> you're, going, you're like, put the fucking pen down. <laughs> <laughs> Run! <laughs> yeah. But yeah, but yeah, I love it. Like, I'm literally listening to the Lovecraft Society. Um, the, the, you can get it on Audible. It's like everything by Lovecraft. Um, yeah. Uh, sort of not dramatized, but read it dramatically, I suppose, by yeah, um, right. uh, the lo- members of the Lovecraft Society, and it's great. It's um, but so, I mean, I've been also reading about you know because there's a lot of um, occult thinkers or writers that believe Lovecraft's dreams were kind of received wisdom yeah, right. sort of thing. Um, I'm just reading a book at the moment called The Faceless Gods or Faceless God rather um, by Thomas Thomas Vin- Vincent or Vincent. Um, and yeah, he's he's sort of focused in on Nala Fotep, and Nala Fotep's a really interesting character. Um, yeah. He's probably the most interesting character. Him and is it Azathoth? Azathoth? I always get that mixed yeah. up wrong. But the two, I love it when Lovecraft kind of goes into these kind of more astral kind of. Um, yeah, almost, it's, it's almost religious, isn't it? Yeah, it's yeah. kind of like the Nala Fotep first appearance, where it's it's a man recounting people kind of mesmerized by this uh, yeah. showman almost. It kind of drags them away into the yeah yeah. They the, sort of go off in gr- weird groups that, and uncontrollably walk in these like like weird situations. It's it's yeah. I mean, it's, well, there's no one like Lovecraft. It's a really interesting kind of paranoid vision of uh, the coming of television and film in that, because that's, mm. you know, Narlathotep shows up with his, like, films, and then, like, the people mm. get, like, enraptured by that and drawn into the world. Um, I like, I really like the dream cycle ones, which are, mm. you know, a, a kind of interesting, yeah, it's, if you know about lucid dreaming, you've ever experienced it, and then you read the dream cycle stuff, it's really a, an interesting reflection on that experience, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, so he was because initially Lovecraft was kind of he was a pulp writer, wasn't he? Essentially, yeah. it wasn't yeah, really yeah. Oh, recognized all, yeah, as a kind of, yeah, he wasn't mm-hmm. kind of recognized as like a great writer, was he? Until years later, like decades later, I yeah, don't think yeah. he was ever ever anything but a pulp writer. It's just yeah. like I think pulp gained more um, mm-hmm. respect. Yeah, it, it's mm-hmm. like a good example, Philip K. Dick. Right, mm-hmm. like yeah. In, yeah. until the until the Vallis trilogy, everybody just thought of him as a pulp writer. Uh, you know, a clever one, um, who definitely had some insight and and brought in elements that we hadn't seen brought in so strongly into sci-fi before, like philosophical elements. Mm-hmm. But you know, like there wasn't um, th- nobody thought he was this great mystic writer until right. You know, basically until the the, the Vallis trilogy, and, and then. When people found out the backstory of that, right. then they were like, "Oh, wait a minute! This guy's writing about a real experience, like right. stuff that's really happening to him." Yeah, if you get the old... book, it is. But there's oh, there's just... a Philip K. Dick, there's a Philip K. Dick story that's very Lovecraft. Um, it's I think a guy goes to a planet and they discovers this creature that lives under the sea, and it's it's sort of. It, 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 it's very dream logic in it. I was reading it thinking, my God, this is Lovecraft. This is like <laughs> Philip K. Dick doing Lovecraft. I can't remember. I'll, if I remember, I'll put it in the show notes of the show. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's incredible. It's a really good story. It's super underrated as well. It's got a really stupid title. I think that's probably why no one knows it. <laughs> but it, I, I can't remember if it's Did a you, short story or a book. I was going to say one of his short stories, probably. It, yeah, it's 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 it feels like it's philip k dick doing lovecraft so it's like lovecraft in space kind of thing almost it's it, it might it's, be um, it, might, it might be it's fantastic it's uh sorry i cut you off dave what were you gonna say oh, i was just gonna say if you look at the the original pressings of his books and stuff like they're clearly like cheap sci-fi you know i mean it's they've got the, oh yeah they've got the vibe they got the vibe of cheap sci-fi i'm gonna go uh, pull my drape for a minute i'm getting hit with the sun so <clears throat> keep going okay yeah don't don't burn out this <laughs> talking about dracula and they, you got uh, some coming on you they always have these amazing lurid covers don't they the, the original love no these the, were like these were like the cheap ones like not even a good like, oh, right. a good illustration yeah they just they look like crap um oh, right you know which has its own charm i i enjoy crap so cultural crap is what do you think about this idea go-to. i always think about this about certain people being transmitted information lovecraft's clearly one of them but obviously we've spoken about it a little bit before but 
could it, okay, Dick, as well, what do you think that is, that kind of thing that happens to certain people, like Leary, you could say David Icke to a degree. Um, Whoa, can we? Know, we? <laughs> can we say David Icke? <laughs> well, David Icke, had, a... it, I guess it's how you interpret it, isn't it, afterwards? Yeah. That, yeah, finds oh, you are yeah, as a character, I suppose. Yeah. Well, so that's because this is that I think that's key, right? Like, I think that, um, mm -hmm. so I, I'm really influenced, uh, you know, and this is obviously very speculative and, and not scientific, but I'm very influenced by folks like Stephen Halpern, the, the musician, um, who sort of pioneered what became electronic music uh, in a popular sense and ambient music, mm -hmm. uh, new age music. But um, he is very, you know, he was out in the Redwoods and got this download that he heard the new music. And then he encountered a Rhodes, <laughs> like a Rhodes electric piano. Mm -hmm. And he was like, oh, I can make the sounds that I heard. And right. there's this other guy, Iasos, um, who around the same time was receiving what he thought was these, this alien music of this music of the future. And same deal, like he discovered synthesizers and was like, now I can make these sounds, I can make this this music, you know, and this is around the same time period, same time period that Leary was getting a Starseed uh, download and all that. So, um, but, you know, it, he, he interprets, like Halpern interprets it through time. So, his understanding of what that meant kind of grew and like the, the myth, his own personal mythology behind it or his own personal understanding of it grew to the point where um, he was with Puharic and uh, uh, what's her name? Um, I'm forgetting her name, but she was uh, early environmentalist. She was actually a corporate consultant and like very well known as a corporate consultant kind of, uh, I think she did executive searches or something like that. And um, uh, I wish I could remember her name, but uh, so Halpern was hanging out with them. He receives another download uh, through her channeling what what she felt was these non-human intelligences from this planetary system or something. And they told him basically that um, what you put into it comes out of it, right? Like you're, if you're writing something, um, your your emotion and everything is literally being ingrained in that that media. And then that's going out to people, you mm -hmm. know, and then those people are interpreting that in their own way. Mm -hmm. And I think that any of these things really, it's not one, it's, I think it's really easy to think about the individual receiving a download and then that's something, but that's not meaningful without the relationships to everything else. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's certain people, that's kind of how I look at um, what Jeff Kripal calls authors of the impossible, you know, like Valet, who like reshaped what we think of, of UFOs, Keel, um, you know, uh, the the woman that uh, worked with Puharic, whose name I can't remember. There's a lot of these different people that kind of stand out as these sort of charismatic hubs of these ideas that then get transmitted to other people. Um, Mark Bacuzzi at Winbridge actually did a test of this um, a couple of years ago where he, you know, the like Dean Radin does a lot of work with um, measuring and trying to test if you can put intention into objects that then transfers to somebody else they were doing it with cloth like to like cotton cloth put a healing intention in there and then would that heal other people and they've gotten results back that seem positive and so mark wanted to test that with um, number sequences so what he would do is he would have people focus an intention on this number sequence and then he would embed the number sequence in a game that somebody else would play and then that person would play it and then they would be uh, surveyed afterwards about their uh, what they felt, right? Like what their what their reaction was. And he found statistical, uh, you know, statistically relevant results that kind of showed that the intention that was put into that sequence that was running behind whatever the object was that the people were manipulating in the game showed up in the results afterwards right like so if it was anger like the people would say oh i felt like more angry or if it was you know happy they would feel more happy and so you know i kind of think of it like that so like lovecraft um you know and there's also uh, people put a religious and kind of or you know even if it's a new age religious idea on this like a belief onto it but if you really just look at the mechanics of it like if you have lucid dream experiences they're incredibly powerful and it's clear, you know, with the historical record that there's 
there's things that carry over, right? Like there's, there's experience, there's feelings. Like one of the things I really liked about the, um, his dream cycle was that when he's describing Randolph Carter going into these states and how he gets there, if you've ever done um, certain lucid dream inductions, he's describing that state, right? Like he's, he's, you can see where he's describing the feelings that somebody has when they're going into that lucid dream state. And so, um, you know, and I think that those things are, are resonant. I always step back from when a belief system is put on that and it says, oh, we really have elder gods that are coming in and, and doing whatever, you know, I think yeah, that yeah, yeah. they're describing an experience and they're describing, you know, the kind of visions and everything that comes up. But um, when you put a meaning on it, that there's actually some kind of thing. I think that's where we kind of got to take a step back until we, you know, understand that. And it's the same thing with stuff like Diana Pasalka's, uh work on encounters and downloads and these people that are saying that they're getting, um, you know, transmissions. I mean, there's people out there who are getting patentable information, which they should not have. They don't have the skill set to, to be able to create what they're creating, but they're getting these, you know, quote unquote downloads that they then can write out information that someone else who understands the engineering or the science behind it can say, oh, okay, I can work with that and I can take that and do something else. Um, Marcel Vogel was a IBM researcher who did that. He created black, the black light paint would be the least, uh, so the more pop culture end of it, but he also created the magnetic strips that went into hard drives and, uh, the credit cards. And he did it through downloads that he said were given to him by a glowing woman, you know, like a, which he interpreted as a Marian visitation, but, you know, he was also mm -hmm. interested in, in <clears throat> not intelligence and UFOs and stuff like that. But again, I think that the story, the narrative around that, I think we got to be careful, you know, was it really Mary that came to him or was that just his belief system putting it on this experience, you know, and that's not very helpful in a certain extent, because then you're just sort of stuck in like, okay, people have these experiences, but if you start and recognize that the experience exists, you can kind of maybe feel that out a little bit. So, yeah, but I mean, that, 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 kind of... that trickster thing, don't they? They say it's like yeah, trickster yeah. Um, yeah. kind of um you know, the many you know there's the many faced kind of um entity or whatever that comes down mm -hmm. and delivers this information and it will often appear in a form that's um recognizable or you know yeah i mean that's that's the thing and, it's like it's going to appear in a way that you can translate yeah. mm -hmm. yeah. which means that it's that it's um it's a co-creation thing that's going on mm -hmm. it's like it's meeting you halfway but you're meeting it halfway right. which is which is why I think oftentimes these things take the absurdity by design aspect to the interaction, right. which is because mm -hmm. it's speaking a language that's probably very deep subconscious language or language of dreams in a lot of ways. So it, it seems like it's absurd and it is, but it doesn't mean it's not communication. Right. It also, it, it also doesn't mean that you're seeing the Virgin Mary if you are seeing the Virgin Mary, it's because that's what you need to see right. to, to, to understand it and assimilate it, right? Well, but it, it, it can literally come to you in any way it needs to. Right. The and I think it's too, the same as like DMT as well, isn't it? People that take DMT that say oh, they're very much yeah, like DMT. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They're, they're sort of showing this like global or well, this universal information and then can't interpret it properly and then forget it or, you know, whatever happens. Right. It, it's just through not be allowed to describe or kind of in you know uh, sort of what's the word i'm looking for kind of absorb what they're being shown that kind of thing it's yeah. kind of like right. unless you unless you have the kind of uh, the you know the codex or whatever you need to kind of right. capture it properly then you know and, well, and to translate it then yeah and that that codex idea i think that's what um to me that's what like the virgin mary is right because we say that mm -hmm. and um people just think of, you know, the, the religious icon, right? And it's the, the mother of, of Jesus or whatever. But if you actually go to the, the metaphysics that are described with the Virgin Mary, like that's a really complex system. You know, Marian devotion yeah. is yeah. not just like praying to Mary or whatever. I mean, there's a right. whole metaphysics that goes into that, which goes well beyond, you know, and that's where the Protestant and Catholic divide comes because the Protestants are like, oh, this is all whatever, you know, and they want to bring yeah. it all back down to like, you know, basic, like just human kind of uh, thing. Whereas the Catholic uh, devotional traditions have these whole, it's a whole system 
you know, and you can, and it, you can see parallels in how they're, tr they're treated, you know, and that's why there's a lot of cross-cultural, uh, well, they, the, the Catholics inherited a lot of this from the pagans. Well, yeah, yeah. And it, well, it's, you know, Neo, Neoplatonism and theurgy, right? Yeah, and yeah. There's, yeah, there's a yeah. whole, whole system there. And also, you know, there's a lot of cross-cultural conversation going on between, um, Catholic contemplatives and, uh, Tibetan and, and Buddhist from other regions, uh, contemplatives. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you have like somebody like Francis Tizo, um, father Tizo, who, you know, that's his thing. He's, he's over there in conversation with high level meditators in the Tibetan traditions. And, um, and then, and then seeing the parallels of people who are deep into the Marian devotions. And these are, it's almost like a machine, you know, I mean, Buddhism talks about vehicles, right? And I think that each of these kind of symbolic sets are vehicles and you have the experiential base, but then the vehicle is a culturally transmitted uh, kind of patterning that can make sense of those experiences and then bring them forward to something else because it's always pointing to something else, you know? I think a lot of people get stuck in the sort of, the the TV narrative version, right? Like the narrative version of like, oh, I am worshiping Mary or I am worshiping X, you know, deity or whatever. But, you know, in, in the, you know, in Buddhism, deity yoga, it's not about a person and a deity. It's about the person and the person as the deity, you know, but the person is not the person. It's it's about the cosmic, you know, it's about the actual beingness that we all inhabit and then how mm -hmm. that reflects and then how you can use that to get to the realization mm -hmm. of a wider, more open beingness, which mm -hmm. negates all of those things. You know, it accepts them, they exist there, but then they there it's bigger than that and it's all interconnected and you know, everything is Buddha kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, and it's easy to talk about uh, and just kind of lose yourself in those words and concepts, but the actual experience of it is quite different, you know, but I think of those, I think of those things, like the things that they appear as, you know, whether it's an alien or a, a God form or whatever, I think those are almost like, they're almost like you said, like a codex for, for that you enter into, you know, and that you can then yeah. sort of translate mm -hmm. that experience that you're having in a way that's functional you know, and move forward. Mm -hmm. I think our problem now is we're so decentralized and everything becomes the most surface layer of what it is. And you don't have a lot of deep practitioners that are, that are immersed in that, that can bring, you know, combine the, the depth of the experience with the symbol set that's put on top of it, you know, or the signs that are put on top of it. Mm -hmm. That's why I find yeah. it's helpful to walk it backwards into something like animism. Mm -hmm. Where yeah. you get down, get down to like primal forms of things. Yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah. And then, and then you don't have to do so much translation. I mean, right. your brain, your brain will do it anyway. Exactly. Yeah, you're gonna it's overlay. Like, yeah, I'm gonna overlay what I need to overlay so I can have a conversation with this intelligence. Right. And this intelligence mm -hmm. is coming together to have a conversation with me, and then I'm meeting it halfway and putting a form on it. Mm -hmm. And then yep. when it's speaking to me, I'm you know, like I'm running the. Um, well, what did the, the tricorder <laughs> uh, I'm running, the, I'm running the translator, like right. basically it's running through my translator so that I can understand it. Right. Because again, I keep point, pointing back to this, but like, it, I think it's crucial is like many times these things take on these aspects of absurdity, but it's not really absurdity. Right. It, it seems absurd because we're trying to map some sort of left brain logic on top of it but like it's not speaking to you from that point right it's speaking to you through intuitive intuitive language it's talking to you through dream logic right which mm -hmm. is a way of speaking and communicating it's just that you were for some reason when people have trouble with it they're not like just letting go and tapping into that part of it which again that's why shamanism and animism helps with that for me it helps with it because i don't try to map so much you know, uh, of this linear shit on top of it. I'm just like, this is, this is a force, right? It's all mm -hmm. it has to be. It's a force. Which is interesting. Mm -hmm. Cause that's, I mean, that's medieval. If you go back to, you know, like Paracelsus and, and the kind of medieval framing of contemplative magic, I guess, I don't know. Yeah. That, that's yeah, probably yeah. not a good term, but um, it'll you work. Know, you, <laughs> yeah, if you if you go back to that, that's what they're doing, right? Like that it's clear that that's what's going on. Like in in the more meditative forms of alchemy and and the descriptions, it's very clear 
that, you know, and, and it's said, right? It's like, we're, we're putting on a sign or a symbol on top of this, but do not mistake the gold for the, the gold, right? Like the exactly. gold of the philosophers is not the gold of commerce, you know? And so right, right. Um, it's always speaking to that. And somewhere along the line, it gets, it gets kind of lost in accepting the, the symbol for the thing, you know? And it's, it's, it's a different thing. And it's, you know, in theurgy and Neoplatonism, again, it's the same kind of thing. You always go back to uh, a sense of holism, which is being then partitioned down into stuff, you know? Um, yeah. I grew up reading apophatic, uh, you know, the negative theology. So the idea that you negate all of that, right? Like if you meet the Buddha in the road, kill him. Um, you know, like many will come and say that they're Jesus, but they're not actually Jesus and don't think that, you know? And so um, that was kind of in high school, I was you know, I'm sitting there reading like St. John of the Cross and Pseudo Dionysus and stuff and, yeah. and getting into that idea. So I'm always, I'm always negating, you know, and, and going to that. And, and nature helps with that, you know, because you you go into nature and you have that experience where it's, you can't name it, you know, you can't name, there's no figures, there's no framework that's culturally uh, there. It's simply, and if you try to name it, it flees. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, and it'll fight you too, because that's one of the funny things is, you know, when I moved to uh, rural Georgia and we were on like 114 acres of woods, um, going back and looking at kind of the, like the pop culture, like, oh, nature is good. I want to live in a cabin in the woods kind of thing. And yeah. it's like, you know, you like ticks really? Like you really want to go out and like lay in the field <laughs> and just get covered in sugars and ticks? Like, no, you don't. Like nature doesn't want you. Like nature is not, you know. Well, nature anybody. wants you. Nature wants to consume you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And like, and that's And decompose you. <laughs> right. And then, and you get to a point where like you go into it with this like, ooh, I'm going to go out in nature, you know, and then you're yeah, like yeah. ticks and like the first yeah. time that you get a really bad attack of chiggers, right? Which are like little mice yeah. that like bite you. Like I had like a psychedelic experience where I had uh, been doing some work around the property and my legs were just like raw with chigger bites. And um, I went to the library and I was driving and it was really hot and my car doesn't have air conditioning. So I was like, you know, already like kind of like in a a state and I stepped out of the car and it just released like histamines into my body. And I was like, Whoa, like I was literally like, Oh my God, like I'm tripping on bug bites, you know, like a Burroughs kind of like situation where I'm like, I'm right. high on being devoured by bugs. Right. And, but you get to a point where you're not worried about that anymore. You know, right. now I'm like, Oh, whatever. It's a tick. Like, you know, like I, I could get Lyme disease and all the rest of it, but what are you going to do? Right. It bit yeah. me. It's yeah, here. Yeah. It's there. It's, you don't worry about it. You get, I went from being like, um, kind of blood averse, you know, like where if I got a cut, I'd be like, Oh, you know, you know, Oh, it hurts or whatever. So now where I'm like, at oh, whatever, you know, like, that's fine. Like I got cut cause you're in thorns, you know, there's thorns, there's, mm -hmm. you know, you walk yeah. in sandals and so, you know, the, the picture of like people walking barefoot in sandals and nature and that it cut up. You know, I mean, if you're really in like the woods and you're not in some like, well, oh, this is why sandals were invented. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, oh, wow. My feet are getting destroyed. You know, like this is crazy. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that and that that takes all those illusions away. You know, you don't have the narrative of like beautiful nature that you're in this thing. It's, it's gorgeous. It's wonderful, but it's deadly. And like you said, it wants to consume you. That's what happens in nature. Things die and they get reprocessed, yeah, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And you're entering into that space and, you know, there's no illusions there. If once you're, once you're being devoured by bugs, mosquitoes, snakes, you know, I mean, right. walk out to your car and there's a, you know, a copperhead that's, you know, a couple feet long and it's just sitting by your mm -hmm. door. Like that thing doesn't want to snuggle you, you know, it wants, it doesn't want to deal with you and it will, it will go off on its own, but it may also, if you get too close and you don't realize it's there, you could get bit and poisoned and die, you know, and that's yeah. nature. Yeah. So. You know, I mean, that's, and that, that to me, like that, that's the beauty of it. Like, cause it's taking you out of that cultured, civilized, basically useless for anything other than building the machine person. Disneyfied taking, nature. Yeah. 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 yeah I mean, that's what Disney has done. It's, it's like, yeah, it's, like perver nature, yeah. It, it's perverted the, the, the concept of nature. So like, we don't really, we have this Pollyanna idea of what nature is yeah nature is a great thing nature is a beautiful wonderful thing nature will eat you in a yeah. heartbeat and not even think about it no 
And that's all you yeah. have to know. Yeah. Like and that, when, and when you're in the woods sitting there, like having a vigil, you have to remember that like half the things that are out there with you want to eat you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, or don't in want anything to another. do with you at all. Or, or, like, or, or, or trying to you. avoid you because they think <laughs> you're going to eat them. You're like, right. I mean, that's it. Mm-hmm. That's really what's going yeah. on. And you can see the, and the other interesting thing, you know, that you see is that our idea of what that means, because we have this warlike, aggressive, um, taking, you know, like consuming nature. And yeah. that's not, that's not what nature does, right? That's mm-hmm. a, that's a totally different thing. Like nature doesn't just like, eh, like I want everything for myself. Like I'm going to sit on right. this big mass of, of things. Um, you know, like yeah, d- nature doesn't hoard. No, nature doesn't hoard. And, and yeah. it also, it gets along. It accepts that it accepts that it's dangerous. Like um, we have an outside cat. That's this just like big cat that just, he's, he's, he's an outside cat. He's, it's what he does. Um, yeah. And uh, he was in his like little enclosure and I walked out there and he's in his like little nest bed thing, just chilling. And there's a possum in the cage with him. Like, just like hanging out. Like it's when I say cage, it's like open, you know, you can go in and out and all the rest right. of it. There's a possum in there just hanging out because they're not predators. The right. possum knew that he wasn't going to, you know, the cat wasn't going to eat the possum and the possum didn't want to eat the cat. So yeah. they're just hanging out. They don't yeah. care. Like, there it <laughs> yeah. is. Like, whatever. Like, we're hanging out. And I was like, I was like, what is this? I mean, the cat wasn't even scared. It was just like, well, no, you no. know, like you didn't attack me. Like, mm-hmm. whatever. Like the toads that are out there, the cats know that you can't eat a toad. They're gross. They're poisonous. You know, they're going to taste bad. So they sniff the toads. They hang out. The toads know they're not going to get eaten. So they're hanging out. So we've got like toads and cats and possums and this like yeah. community of, of just hanging, you know? Um, yeah. And it's beautiful. Cause then you realize I've got, like, I've got two raccoons that hang out with my cat. Yeah. And I come out, I come out yeah. in the morning with my coffee and I, and on the porch, they're sitting two raccoons and my cat. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just, <laughs> they're just they're sitting just there. Out. Hey, yeah. what's up? Yeah. And they're not going to bother you, you know. No, they're not going to. No. They don't. And no. then once they get to know you, like they're cool. Like they're like, that's fine. Yeah. Like you're not going to hurt me. I'm not going to hurt you. Like okay, cool. Like let's yeah. just. We all want. We all want to eat. Like all right, let's just have a little meal. You know. Yeah, exactly. Cats just. Uh, cats just hate. They just hate their own, don't they? Cats. <laughs> yeah, that's they the. Just that's really the don't like. We got yeah. another outside cat that doesn't want the other two cats in there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, oh, we've yeah. got a house cat. She Not from, um, you know, not by choice. She just doesn't like going outside. Um, <laughs> but if another, if it, there's this other cat that just, I swear he does it just to wind her up. This big black cat comes and jumps on the windowsill where she sits. And it's like chaos. You, you just like <laughs> a sort of weirdest, like, it almost looks like Kung Fu. They're both going like on the window. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leaving at each other, and yeah, you're just like, well, yeah. you're not going to get each other. You know this. You know this. It's like there's a plane right. of glasses with you. And that's <laughs> partly why they're yeah. doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, yeah, we can go nuts. Yeah, yeah. It, it's like it's like that scene in the bar. I'm sure we've all experienced that. Like you have that one friend who, like, I have this one friend in Chicago, Dennis. You're, if you're listening, Dennis, I'm talking about you. Who will start shit at the bar with like people like ten times his size. <laughs> <laughs> and he's and he's counting on us going holding it back going, yeah. no 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 don't get to that like like a couple of times i just let him go and just he just got pounded just got pounded and they'd be like what why didn't you try to stop me i'm like why did you try to stop? why did you start it <laughs> <laughs> yep yeah like dude that, it, you, you sat down and started t- telling that guy his girlfriend was ugly what do you <laughs> think was gonna happen <laughs> and that's the human thing too i mean that's what's beautiful about nature right like nature will fix that you know because it's not just a beat down. Like, if you go out there and you're like i can do this like no you can't <laughs> no you can't <laughs> it's not you're not up for that you know i mean yeah. i remember the first time i went out in the when we got you know we're on this 114 acre property and we were like there's a there was a quarry which uh, we sort of knew where it was and it was behind the cabin. And so we were like, oh, let's go to the quarry, right? Like it's late afternoon, it's beautiful out. Like, let's go take a walk to the quarry. So we go to the quarry and um, we kind of like wound our way over to it and didn't, didn't take the proper path to it. And we, but we found it, we're there and we're enjoying it and it's beautiful. And I look at the sun going down and I'm like, oh, the sun's going down. We should probably start to make our way back. And I didn't anticipate that when I looked at the sun going down, it was like 
almost down and you've got massive trees so like mm -hmm. what you normally would have is yeah, it's, it's you down still in five have minutes, yeah. yeah and you're like oh crap like it's you know the horizon is up here it's not down here so like if it starts going down a little bit like you're already in the dark in the forest so we totally got lost and we ended up like wandering in the darkness and we didn't have you know we had nothing no nothing to light like no no light or anything because there was a little afternoon jaunt into the woods and we were just completely lost and we ended up like a mile down on the dirt road when we finally made it out we found somebody else's property like wandered through their yard thankfully they were on vacation so like we didn't get shot or anything and we like ended up about a mile down the road in this dirt road so we knew where we were so we walked back to the cabin and the next day i was like where how did we get so lost like what happened so we look and it turned out that from the cabin it was literally like a five minute walk to the quarry like just a straight shot yeah. but we hadn't seen that in the dark and we'd gotten just completely turned around you know so you can imagine if you're actually in that was 114 acres if you're in yeah. you know like the national parks or you know the pacific northwest you end up in the woods like you can get you're gone and if you don't have the right yeah. skill set to do it like yeah you're, you're, you're yeah. gone like that's yeah. it yeah you're, yeah you're lost you know that's mm. like um the the, uh, the groups I used to take out in the desert back in oh this, yeah. Like, yeah back in the day, <clears throat> I would take them out and I would they would they would literally be probably three four miles from civilization, but they, these were city folk. Yep. And they didn't and I'd take them out with and, and on horses and I'd lead them in circles so they, they had no idea where they were and then I'd sit on the hilltop and watch them through binoculars and listen to them. I had a parabolic mic. And I'd listen to him. And I, when they got Lord of the Flies, and I knew they were like out of water and they were out of food, I'd eventually show up and get, get them to the point of like, Jesus Christ, we're going to die out here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then I had them where I wanted them. I'd bring them back and I'd sit them down. I'm like, okay, you're out here to learn how to work together as a group. Let's see what didn't happen. Let's yeah. All the things that broke down. Yeah. Like, you guys can't even work together to survive in the yeah. wilderness. How are you going to be a product team that launches something? How's that going yep. to work? You know, and yep. it really gets their attention. Yeah. Like you really, and, and now when I take people out into the woods for, for vigils, I have a protocol. Like I, like, so they know that like, it might seem like you're middle of nowhere, but I know where you are. And every day you need to like take a stone and leave on this log so that I know you're alive. I actually do know they're alive, but I want them to think, yeah i wonder i hope they find that stone yeah. it's like I, I want them to get that feeling of yeah, i don't so, know where i'm at i don't know what to do out here yeah because yeah because like, it, it resets like, your it resets it your resets everything it just yeah. resets everything because like literally you can drop me anywhere in the forest and i don't get lost for some reason i have a natural sense of direction but most people i notice they're not like that no i'm not like that like you put me in the woods i'm i'm gone the other thing yeah. that's weird about the woods too is you assume that it looks like a certain way you assume that you're familiar with it yeah. where i'm at now i'm on like nine acres and about seven or eight of them are are woods and so i'm very familiar with the local woods but there's still days times of day you know like where it looks completely different yeah. and you're walking mm -hmm. on the trail that you cut and you're like i don't remember this ain't this. the trail like, <laughs> yeah, this isn't, i don't remember this being there or you, yeah. you think you're on the trail that you cut you know and it's like oh wait a second I, i'm like 15 feet like to the other side you know it yeah. doesn't happen often but there's you know those moments where the the forest shifts and you're like uh okay I, <laughs> you know why is this i'm in the surreal world where it should be looking like this and it definitely doesn't do you ever do the the uh, about... forest at night exercise the what now the forest at night exercise what's that if anybody's listening, like, you know, check this out. You go into a forest, you do it on a moonless night, hopefully overcast, and, and you go far enough out that there's not ambient civilization light. And then, so, like, like that darkness, like the yeah. real darkness yeah. that you can experience, like the yeah. real darkness. And when you're in tall trees like I have here, um, you can get, like, super darkness, like nothing. You can't see anything. And you go out, and then you walk through the forest, and when you feel this, like you get that feeling, like a tree's about to hit my face. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Put your hand up and see if there is a tree. Yeah, yeah. And most of the time, you're right. Yep. Sometimes you're not, but most of the time, sometimes I think it's just paranoia. 
It's like this right. tree's gonna hit <laughs> me in the face. Yeah, but, me. yeah, but just kind of relax and like go with it. Like, okay, I'm gonna walk into a tree and it's gonna hurt, but it's like I'm doing this for a reason. You know, um, I'm I'm a I'm a masochist or something, whatever that reason is. But like, <laughs> really, you're just like I you like do it sometime. If anybody's not done that, you should do it sometime and see how many times you're right. You're right more than you think you will be. Yeah, more mm -hmm. often than not, you'll be right. Well, and it opens, I mean, again, that's another thing. It opens up those senses. It opens up our, we're so, people don't realize how ingrained we are in this false mm -hmm. reality that we've created through technology and civilization and machinery. There's and all always light. Aids. There's always light. You know, people think it's dark and then they see the forest dark was interesting because yeah. we had friends from Chicago come down and literally every person from Chicago who came down could not handle the forest at night even with like a porch light on because the sounds yeah. like there's yeah, the overwhelming yeah. sounds of insects yeah so like the or the silence right like where you get the yeah. silent night where it's just like yeah. silence and real silence like there's no or the darkness happening. people there's always, always and the darkness want, yeah when people exactly. come to visit me they're yeah. always like it gets so dark here yeah it's like exactly that's what happens at night dude <laughs> yeah the real, yeah that real and it's like a thick like a, you could it's like a palpable darkness that you can yeah. like feel because you it's, feel you know, it, yeah. your body's like i don't know this this isn't right you know yeah. like this isn't there's no ambient light or anything and like yeah. it's and, and the the once that those senses start to open up you can sense the life around you and you can sense that like yeah. you know it's 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 both the life of like the animal life and the plant life and everything but there's also kind of this this holism that if the forest has been around long enough you know, like the, like people, if you go into like an urban, like forest preserve, it has a very controlled feeling and a very yeah. dead, sometimes very dead or even yeah. a sick feeling, you know, curated. Um, yeah. Curated. <laughs> I mean, unfortunately here we're, we're sort of on like, we're rural, but we're in like the, the borderland rural, you know? So there's a lot of like farmland around and everything. And there's chicken factories and hog farms and the forest feels sick. Like it right. feels like it's not quite robust you know it doesn't have that like palpable feeling but those 114 acres were like untouched you know there had been quarry stuff and there had been houses built but the house that was there was 200 years old you know and so this area was like and then next to it were paper mill uh mm -hmm. pine pine kind of forest farms outside of the 114 acres so that was all right. untouched for five years six years whatever right. Right. And, you know, you get this feeling where it's, it's just this, you can feel the life around, you can feel the, that movement of stuff, you know, mm -hmm. you can, your, your sense of smell will kick up. Yeah. Your sense of hearing will kick up. Yeah. Your sense of taste will kick up. Everything will kick up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're out there long enough. And, and like I said, like when, when you experience like true, true, true darkness, and and especially when you're like an old growth forest like we yeah. have here or yeah, exactly. when, I, when I lived up in the in the redwoods and around Santa Cruz, same thing. I mean Nick Herbert and I used to talk about it. Like he like he's a physicist, but he's also pretty in touch. And we talked about like these trees are really old. It's like yeah. if you count the rings on these trees, they're older than Jesus. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Literally. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 Well, and he, Nick doesn't, I don't know if he still does, but Nick was like living in like a, like a no plumbing cabin. Wasn't he like up in, he was for a Oakland? while. He he's moved to a, a community cause he's, he's, you know, older. He, and, he, he had yeah. a caretaker, but she passed away mm, okay. um, August yeah. and she was a great person. I, I met her a few times. I loved her. Um, but yeah, she passed and then he's now living in a, um, I wouldn't call it an assisted living. It's, it's kind of like, um, a, a farm for old hippies. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Northern California, right? Like yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's up around. Yeah, yeah. It's up around Santa Cruz. It's like they, they don't send them to the home; they send them right. to the farm. <laughs> right. Which is that's that's just amazing about that. Like that that yeah. part of California is like you get like it, it is that it's just like oh it's a community and like you know people retire into just the sort of like uh, you know. It, it's still rough living, you know, it's still not what people, it's not the cozy, the cozy uh, kind of uh, assisted living community. They're still living like out in. Yeah. Out I mean, it, it, I think, I think if I remember correctly, I think Bruce Damer had something to do with this, putting in this community. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely like old psychedelic physicist kind of heads. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> People like me and Nick, like that's where yeah. we retire, you know. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's like it's um that that 
that old growth forest has a whole different vibe or mm -hmm. even the desert. Like when I was out in Joshua yeah. tree, the desert out there is so old. Like it's like everything year around is like so much older than humanity. It's amazing. And mm. you pick up on it. Yeah. It's like completely dark, mm. like dark, dark. And then like, like you said, it's like the, the sounds become overwhelming that you probably wouldn't even hear them if it wasn't for the fact that everything was so quiet. Yeah. That when you do hear things like you hear the coyotes miles away. Right. You know, like in the desert, you don't get so much of the bugs. But like you do get you do get the weird like, you know, things running through the brush and like little <laughs> chittering things. And yeah. All kinds yeah. of weird stuff. Well, and it's and also out the... here, out here, we get like tons of like little mammalian sounds and, and birds that like owls and things that yeah. fly at night. And yeah. Well, and the desert's yeah. interesting, too, because when you hear those noises, you've got nowhere to go. <laughs> You know, I remember right. just, I, yeah, I, no shelter <laughs> when I was a kid. I spent, you know, I was like nine to 12. I was in Arizona and I would just go wander out into the desert and stuff. And there was one time, uh, well, there was one time with, with just random stray dogs. So like I'm out there and like, I climbed up on a hill and I look and I see this stray dog and I'm like, Oh shit. You know, cause if that dog is not friendly like i'm it can outrun me and i yeah, have nowhere fucked. to go like there's no you know if it sees me like i'm you know that thing if it attacks like i'm yeah I'm cooked. yeah or you know the javelina which are the the little uh wild boars you know that are very oh, vicious yeah. and yeah. they don't have they, thankfully they don't have good eyesight but there was another time where i was out in the desert and i saw like three javelina and i was like crap like if that thing charges me like i got nothing like i'm yeah, you know i'm, yeah, I'm gonna be yeah. beaten off pigs with a stick or something you know and i'm nope. like i remember like when i was in the desert, when i was in the desert in saudi arabia um years ago i was really young where i went with my mum and um my stepfather and uh had gunshots going off we yeah. couldn't see where the gunshots were but they sounded yeah. close but we couldn't yeah. see someone yeah. it's probably just because in, in saudi you can get guns and shoot them yeah yeah, you know, yeah. And sometimes yeah. it might not be close because the sound will carry yeah. out there yeah yeah but it's scary as fuck because you can sort of see for miles and you're like well what the fuck is that coming yeah from? Yeah, like, that. yeah i remember just getting back in the car we're like okay we're going and it was like it's like <laughs> yeah. it, there's kind of like a raw to being in places like that where you're like oh actually hang on you just suddenly really it's something clicks in your brain you're like oh, yeah um yeah uh uh, and then we got stuck in sand, so in the car. Right? <laughs> yeah. a, a sandstorm just came out of nowhere and we got stuck. Yeah. So it was like this tremendously weird uh, trip to the <laughs> desert one time. But I did something a bit more in your wheelhouse, I suppose, um, like a couple of weeks ago. Um, I, we tried the CE5 thing. Have you oh, ever yeah, yeah. tried that before? Yeah, yeah I it have. Didn't work for us, but, um, yeah. <laughs> I haven't tried. Really I'm, I'm interested. So there's a um, EVP, electronic voice phenomena. Um, Raymond Bayless was one of the, the early uh, proponents, practitioners of this thing. He was, a, um, he was actually a fine artist and he, he then liaisoned with parapsychology and, and did a lot of stuff in parapsychology. Um, but he, uh, I don't think it was Jurgensen, but he wasn't having any, uh, he couldn't get EVPs. And then he went mm -hmm. and was uh researching with somebody who was getting evps and afterwards he was able to get evps and so mm -hmm. with the ce5 thing i've heard a lot of people um you know experiencers in that talk about uh that contagion factor right like there's stories of people going to visit chris bledsoe and then when they leave they're able to see stuff and i know a couple other people that have they frequently we were doing oh it. yes at the contagion factor yeah and yeah. so if you can find yeah. if you can find somebody who can transmit like you got to find a <laughs> you got to find somebody who's got the juice and then if you can get a little bit of a little bit of that you know and cultivate it um that's kind the, of the way the process go. is really strange though have you ever done it before uh i haven't i've done like basic sort of like uh, come to me sort of meditation stuff didn't work for me either yeah but. yeah there's like a there's an app that you can get isn't there uh, oh, who's the guy the that kind thing. of yeah yeah are you talking is it is it, it the greer app the the stephen greer yeah one? the greer app yeah yeah and it, it's you basically play these sounds that sound a bit like the bbc radiophonic workshop from the 70s yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. and then and then he does like a guided meditation and you do that right. and then we 
sort of yeah and then that, that, that's the kind of come to me meditation kind of thing right but it, the guy that we did it with my friend sam he's had results before i was really hoping to get results but unfortunately my partner was gutted because she was like i really want to see a ufo <laughs> we didn't we didn't uh, well and you don't but, have and any, it's uh, interesting this is a, this is again like the language and science and symbols thing because like it's like i want to see a ufo but what you're going to see is uh an orb i don't know that they've i don't yeah. know that I could be totally wrong because I've uh, the Greer taint like has made me not look at a lot of that stuff. But um, mm -hmm. I don't know that people report structured craft. Um, you know, no, no, that's, I think uh, it's balls of light, like, isn't it? Usually, yeah, yeah, balls of light, which is interesting in and of itself because they're you know reactive mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know they they rea supposedly react to your thought. You can say like, come over here, go over there, and they'll signal to you and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So that's interesting, but. Um, not like structured craft. I'd be interested in seeing people, you know, who can summon a, a structured craft visualization. That would be that would be interesting. Who was the guy? Yeah. There was a um, UFO uh, guy back in the day that um, I think Keel writes about this. But he, he claimed that um, he could summon a UFO at any time, and he was going to. Yeah, Ted Owens. What's the, is You're talking about talking about Ted Owens? No, PK, no, no. Right? It was no. There's been several was on... people that have claimed that claimed that they can do that. It's, it's no, kind of, this is a particular thing. Things. He 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 was he was gonna um there was a, a chat show. I can't is it Gleason? No, I can't remember who it was. There was a chat show where um he said like on this on this day I'm gonna make this UFO appear and he was selling passports to people, he was going around the country, he wasn't making money from it, he was just uh, finding oh. kind of appropriate people. I've forgotten his name now. Um but that's yeah, I mean that's the kind of yes, Marshall yes. Applewhite. Yes. <laughs> 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 no, he's got a name like I think it, it um Kiel talks about him in um what's the good Kiel book? The one the really all of them. Um yeah, yeah the, no the, the the eighth something or other, the the one where he talks Space about Tower. Ultra, the um yeah, Space yeah, Tower. yeah. The what's it called? The super 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 spectrum frequency well, spectrum, that's yeah, it. Super yeah, spectrum. I think yeah. that one. Yeah, he talks about it in there, and that, that was kind of interesting. But then I've I was thinking about something else recently, you know, like the kind of meme is that ever since we all got cell phones um the, mm. the, the kind of cases of photographs of ufos have dropped dramatically you know or right you know oh, really? you, you, you thought yeah well that's apparently uh you know and also <laughs> the other meme is you know we've got all these hd cameras yet we still get blurry yeah you know yeah. blurry pictures but you can't like I'm that's if you start to use that, you can't use a cell phone to take a picture of a freaking bird. I mean, like, they don't, like if you, like a bird, yeah, I mean, like, uh, yeah. Yeah, if it's in know, motion, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you're not. Like, cell phone cameras are terrible. Even the best ones, like, there's no way you can, they focus weird. They're, I think it's mm -hmm. such a, it's like, that's said by people who don't actually try to take pictures in nature or outside. Because <laughs> if you do that, like, it's, it's much harder to get anything in focus, especially at a depth. Like, if it's up in the sky, camera's going to be focusing on the, foreground like and you can't mm -hmm. you can't focus it up into the sky you know what i mean so like mm -hmm. and that's not necessarily true either one of the weird things about uh, i'm sorry i know you've got like a, a further point to this but um mm -hmm. before my brain just jumps somewhere else the mm -hmm. working with the sort of like i don't not underground but like the less public ufo people there's a whole realm of things that are going on people having experiences that are way more uh recorded and and measured and monitored than what what you get mm -hmm. if you just think that what you're seeing in like twitter or, or x um or in social media on youtube and the rest of it is the whole deal of all of humanity having these mm -hmm. experiences like there is a whole lot of people because they don't unless you're part of the subculture of of ufology right like if you're just an experiencer you don't, there's no motivation necessarily to go out and be like, oh, I got these photos and I did all that. Like, why? Like, you or know, even you, report that you had an or experience. Or even report that you had an experience. Right. I've never had one, but if I did, I wouldn't report it. No, I wouldn't either. I mean, there's no reason to. I mean, what are you yeah. not going to get any answers? Like, nobody knows. And well, I like, think it was. Yeah, but you'll say that. But then I think you're me. not factoring in the, um, not necessarily factoring in the need that everyone has these days to. Put everything on social media. <laughs> That's not everybody thing, which... does, though. I mean, like, really, not everybody no. does. Like, I've talked to a lot mm. of people like that I have don't. have some pretty extreme mm. experiences, and they don't bring it up on social media. Yeah, it's not brought out, yeah. and there's because they don't. They're just regular people. I mean, let's we have you know, it's 
we get blindsided, and this is why I keep doing the uh, the Google Trends mapping of people's the public interest through Google searches on UFOs. It's not there, right? Like it's just mm -hmm. not there. It's 2008, Stevensville. That's where it was because it was publicly reported. There were right. local journalists on the story. Right. This military stuff, no one in the public cares about at all. Right. They don't right. care because right. it has nothing to do with their lives. Well, except that, for know, a subset I mean, of people who are a subset fans, of people. Yeah, yeah, fans exactly, of that were, thing. Yeah, yeah. Right. And, that's, and they that's were it. they were before before this right. became yeah public. does it, well and no sometimes there are some people that have come into it now where they've seen the information and they're like oh yeah. okay like now it's legit so they're starting yeah. to look at it yeah and there is that but they're mm -hmm. all relearning you know and they're it's interesting that conversation because they don't know the history of it really you know so everything's new and everything's exciting and you're like yeah somebody wrote that in 1950 like we already we've been there like that's yeah. already that's already existed and yeah. so. Um, and this is again the decentralization, but so that just to, I, you had another point, and I totally derailed that. But the the um, the <laughs> camera footage thing, you know, I mean, there's mm. there's a ton of stuff, and and the people with the camera footage too, because of the the because of the government, military intelligence involvement, um, a lot of people don't want to put it out there, you know. I mean, because what who's gonna who's gonna show up at your house if there really if there is a there there. It's not going to be like the friendly, like, oh, hey, that's cool that you saw a UFO. I'm a scientist that's interested in this. <laughs> you know, the only people who are going to show up are going to be people who are like, oh, okay, you saw something cool. Let's uh, let's talk about that. That's yeah. what happened to Chris Bledsoe. Mm -hmm. Chris Bledsoe put mm -hmm. his stuff up on MUFON, right? MUFON stole the IP, made a documentary that was not Chris's experience. And the next thing he knew, he had knocks on his door from, you know, people that were uh, loosely associated with uh, military intelligence saying, hey, you had these experiences. Everything you've said maps out to some other stuff that we know. Let's talk. And he didn't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Right. So, like, you know, that's not a pleasant situation to be in. So a lot of people won't put their stuff out there. And then the other end of it, too, is if you're at a, a higher tier of, you know, if you're, let's say you're a scientist or whatever, and you have this experience, well, then people are going to be, who's interested in it right now that has money, right? Bigelow. Bigelow wants mm -hmm. to make IP off of it. So if you interact with Bigelow, he's going to loop you into some kind of contract and get you involved in, yeah. in something for, for his benefit as a business yeah. person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thiel, Peter mm -hmm. Thiel, yeah. very interested in the subject. What is Thiel into it for? He doesn't want to know the secrets of the universe and betterment of humanity. He wants tech. So if, you know, what's mm -hmm. your motivation to go out and say, hey, I had this, this life-changing experience. Now I got a bunch of venture capitalists hanging out trying to like, you know, milk <laughs> me for stuff like that's not or, you know that's or not. you get the other side of the coin which i've experienced is like just random crazy people show up at your door right yeah exactly mm -hmm. yep there's that too yeah there's that that you know like, just god like, told me to find you and yeah and, god, and, god, god. and it's well, that loops, god, god, that loops back into the know? that loops back into the point i was about i was actually Good. trying to make which was um Good. um one thing i noticed that there's that meme about ufos you know, regardless of if it's true or not. Um, but what, what happened to um, miracles? This is another thing. You know, like people used to report miracle stuff all the time. You know, like random healings, do. and um, they still do. Yeah, but not, I mean, that's, not in the same way. It's not. It's, it's not mediated it's, it's, in the same way. No, I it's think, only. But, there. I, but I. But I think they do re report it yeah. in the same way. I think what happens is it doesn't get repeated by the media so we right. don't we're not exposed to it in the same way because they've moved right. on to something else right just like you i can mm -hmm. feel the gas running out of the uap thing in the media mm -hmm. like yeah. they care less about that and yeah. they're on to they're looking for the next thing they're always looking for the next thing these yeah. people right mm -hmm. media like let, let's just get this straight people that work for the media and the media organizations themselves are parasites yeah period yeah. Mm -hmm. they're yeah. looking for experiences oh, yeah. that are not theirs that they can exploit for money yeah period yep. period end of mm -hmm. sentence that's it and we have to remember yeah. that we can never forget that well and and to to the point about mediation too right like if we think about these like the miracles why was that a thing it was because there was that like there were all those tv shows that were out that were all about like you know like it's a miracle like it was like kind of like guideposts like readers yeah, digest yeah. sort of like things sightings uh mysteries of the unknown Blah 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 blah. There were all these, but they were they were centralized. We didn't have the internet, right? Like you couldn't have six thousand podcasts mm -hmm. about you know people having healing experiences. Now we do. Um, now we do, <laughs> and it's it's watered down because then you also have creepy pasta, and you have you know you don't trust any of it. 
So you have, you know, a podcast, like they've got those Bigfoot. Um, it's, I forget that there's one that has a name that's basically like Bigfoot experiences. And like every week they have another person telling a Bigfoot experience. Mm -hmm. It's so saturated. You're like, okay, is that real? Like, how is there like 10 million people having these big foot experiences? It starts to warp your, your thought pattern of, of how that mm -hmm. actually plays out. You know, well, they, but, they get, they get into that pattern I where meant, the, the media, the media producers start looking for desperately looking for the next story. Right. Yeah. The next, next yeah. I didn't really mean the kind of, the kind of casual miracles, you know, I, I'm not talking about the kind of, um, the casual, casual know. miracles, no. I start a podcast you know, you know what I mean? Casual like, miracles. You know. I want to, <laughs> yeah. casual miracles. Casual. Okay. But you know, I mean, like some, uh, one random person experiences something they can't explain and it must be right. I'm, not, I'm talking about the big miracle things. Like, You're talking about the, something again, like Fatima, it, right? Yeah, You're exactly. About something like yeah, Fatima, that, like the thousands yeah, of people see the, happen the virgin. Yeah, that's or, an interesting. Like, a whole group of fee people feel this like energy build, and all of a sudden, all their ailments are gone. That kind of thing. Like, yeah, yeah, you yeah. just don't seem to get that. There's anymore. been there's and, been reports of of that happening with Bledsoe. Oh, okay, interesting. Yeah, but again, it's it. You know, I mean, uh, is that true? You know, <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. and and so another interesting thing about the miracles too, right? Like, because I just did um, mm -hmm. for that for the uh, course one for with. Diana Pasolka and the Beyond the Stars curse that we're doing. Um, the in course one, I did a, a section on the the cultural context of 1947 and Kenneth Arnold sightings, um, and, and loosely the Roswell thing. But the Roswell thing wasn't important to people until like the 70s. Um, but that that time period was also a healing revival, and it was a healing revival that like Oral Roberts, who you know people may still know. Uh, Mm -hmm. came out of a lot of the you know televangelism was born in that healing mm -hmm. revival and the thing was was Alistair that Crowley died Alistair Crowley <laughs> died yeah exactly yeah and that mm -hmm. was you know and there was uh Trident there were all these you try mm -hmm. yeah you got Trident like um but there's all these healings that were being reported and it was this healing revival right so like tens of thousands of people showing up to like a thing and like you got the pastor and the healing and the whatever but when the journalists came to it there was no healings and so the media was reporting this like massive wave of healings because the televangelist or the the evangelists at the time were, were pushing this this thing and the people were believing it within their circles but when the journalists came there were they were seeing people go up to the stage on crutches and leave on crutches and then they would come to another healing revival and there'd be that same person on crutches coming in to get another healing and so the 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 evangelists had created their own media <laughs> so they were reporting these healings but the journalists were like we're not seeing it people you know like we eh, this isn't working so there's also that right like these i'm massive... gonna beat the slot machine this time I'm gonna yeah beat this yeah, time. yeah I'm, gonna beat gonna, this time. I'm winning i'm winning i'm a winner this is the like, one. You're, this is the you're, one. To you're totally out of money like you're broke like no no i'm the win um but that yeah and so you know there's this this weird mediation and unfortunately i think this again goes back to that narrative thing where it's so easy to get caught up in these narratives. It's real. It's not real. You know, these, these kind of things, but, uh, the, it, maybe that's part of the trickster phenomena at the trickster aspect of this stuff. That's but definitely part you, of it. Yeah. You got to go deeper. Like you got to go deeper because there were not necessarily healings, but there were light phenomena that were captured on film. There were weird things right. that were happening around these revivals. Right. right. Possibly because you had a whole mass of people all believing one thing and and getting amped up and energized and stuff like that. Maybe that has you know some effect or whatever. But um, just the very fact that it happened and that people were able to gather in that, you know, like like I couldn't step out into the street and say I was a healer and then suddenly have you know massive amounts of people around me. These people were able to create that situation, and there's something weird about that. There's something interesting there to look at, you know. Um, yeah, and but when you're, you try I, to put it when you try to put a spotlight on it, then you get the effect. That, a lot of times, you get the effect that I like to use the analogy of the uh, the Warner Brothers cartoon where the guy finds the frog that sings, <laughs> and every time he tries to show somebody, it won't, it doesn't sing, and yep, then they leave. Yep. And as soon as they leave, the frog starts yeah. singing again. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it, it's really yeah. You're, to your point though, yeah, I don't. There hasn't been really like a but Stevensville in two thousand eight was a mass sighting. 
Uh, and this mm -hmm. is something that I've brought up too, is that we don't have waves, like for the UFO subject in particular, we don't have waves and we haven't had them since the seventies. And people will say, well, mm -hmm. no, there's people seeing them or it's, you know, like, a, a, like I said, previously decentralized media and so we don't get it reported but when you talk to people who were in those waves who actually saw the thing we don't have that like i know you know like right mm -hmm. where i'm at now uh 15 minutes away is a place where a guy uh well known in the community uh had there were police the sheriff saw it everything there was a full structured craft ufo that they saw that like came down over there. Uh, it was a slaughterhouse at the time, and it was where they were dumping the carcasses mm. uh, prior to pickup. And it, a, a craft came down and hovered over it, you know. And they they said mm. they saw it. The sheriff saw it. The you know, but it's not in the community lore because we don't live in those mm. kind of communities that carry on those stories. So I only know because I know uh, one of his friends who happened to be staying at that place. So you know that but we don't see that really anymore we don't see that kind of thing those those the wave is is very different from from the orb sightings or the the ce5 and mm -hmm. it's kind of more decentralized even decentralized in the sense of how it's happening to people you know not just how it's mediated yeah we've we've got a place down the road that's similar to that it, um clapham woods which i'm interested in for other reasons as well but um that's there's, that's always seemed a more interesting spot to me for UFOs purely because so many people had you know so there were there were evenings where you, there were UFO sightings but loads of people saw it yeah and yeah reported on it and it was reported in the media and it was you know right. and you can go back and find those people that all saw it there's some sort of like disconnect there's some sort of thing when a group a big group of people report on something that seems to give it a bit more oomph for some reason yeah. do you see what i mean like yeah when i don't know i guess because it's like it's being kind of verified by more than yeah. one person or more yeah. you know the handful of people but and again like well i mean it, 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 it might also happen because there's enough people there to generate it yeah that's the yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. like you've got a bunch of people focusing on something and then and it kind of manifests into whatever they can understand again though like mm -hmm. those kind of those kind of sightings or, or experiences, uh, I don't want to call them sightings, experiences like that, if you talk to, if you break them out into like individual people and sit them down and talk to each one, each one of those people saw something slightly different, sometimes mm -hmm. va vastly different, but usually mm -hmm. slightly different. Like yeah. they, they, they all, all ran the time, their right? mm -hmm. the, oh, yeah. stuff yeah. you get, like yeah. you get, get multiple people seeing this having the same experience but seeing completely different craft or yeah, different yeah. shape or different color i mean even yeah. even like yeah. something like fatima like the different people that, that yeah. they talked to they would they would see different things like yeah. everybody mm -hmm. saw a light in the sky and like and the sun did a thing mm -hmm. like generally yeah. they all agree on that but what mm -hmm. the light looked like and what kind of color it was and what it did in the sky and what the thing that the sun did is different yeah Again, that could well, be the codex thing again, though, couldn't it? But yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, and then and to the codex point too, then you have the the Catholic Church coming in, and they've got to fit it within oh, the framework of, course, of their yeah. theology and their, yeah, their doctrine yeah. and dogma. So then you get a reframing of it that comes afterwards. So you're you know? saying you saw the Virgin Mary? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's exactly it. And when you go, you know, like uh, Diana's talked about going in and reading the original material and of the witness statements and the rest of it and and yeah. it's what you're saying joe is it's it's different perspectives yeah. and it's not it's not the dogmatic doctrinal framing no. of the event at all yeah. you know mm -hmm. even uh kripal's been talking about this on some podcasts lately too like saint francis like saint francis's experiences right like the the he gets the stigmata you know, but the thing is, is like, that's not how they did crucifixions. <laughs> that's how it right. was represented yeah. in, in Catholic art. You know, it right. wasn't, right. They, they don't, they didn't crucify through here. You did it through here and they were crossed, you know, it's mm. so for him to get these as a sign of, uh, you know, his, his Christian, whatever, like, eh, not really like that's, that's Catholic art, you know? And yeah. so, mm -hmm. um, and then he dies very young from you know and and is bleeding profusely this wasn't like a pleasant like we you know you got francis holding like butterflies and a statue in your yard but the reality of saint francis was that like you know he was like issuing Hemorrhaging. blood and hemorrhaging, <laughs> like you yeah. know and and having these intense experiences with some sort of light which now um you know some of the research like uh that gary nolan's doing and 
some other folks, um, you know, like those, even those orb things that are not necessarily healthy to be around, you know, whatever it's emitting, it's emitting some sort of, uh, you know, electromagnetic radiation that like is, is going to kind of screw you up a little bit unless you're yeah. one of the lucky ones that gets enhanced you well, know but Kiel, even, Kiel used to yeah. talk about that didn't he yeah he talks yeah. about the kind of radio radiation spectrums yeah. that come off the you know and people will get really sick after being yeah like, oh absolutely experiences. Yeah. yeah and even again even yeah. orbs right like people will have an experience mm -hmm. with an orb and they will get radiation sickness you know i mean it will mm -hmm. it will they will have been exposed to something that's not not healthy you know um so it's you know it's and Bledsoe to bring him up again because he's a contemporary experiencer with this kind of stuff is you know he's reported something similar where it healed him of some things other things got a little bit worse for a while you know like um, it's you know it's a give and take because you're dealing with something you know something dealing that's with the fucking fey man <laughs> <laughs> yeah. you know it's, uh, they're not uh, they want to take your children and and. Uh, bring them underground or like or like you know like if a lot of the uh classic uh, you know encounters with the fey it's like a 50 50 most of yeah. the time it's yeah like they do mm -hmm. some nice things for you but they fuck yeah. you over also yeah it's like and they can is, never they can never just be one thing and it's super <laughs> it's very quid pro quo you know i exactly. mean exactly like stop yeah. giving them milk and like watch out like they're gonna come yeah. and take that milk you yeah. know so yeah. like you're mm -hmm. um and, and make you pay for it, not giving it to them. <laughs> and I, I think it, it, that that also goes back to the nature idea, right? Like the idea that we have of nature is this woo, absolutely it's all fluffy and wonderful mm -hmm. and whatever. But like, if you're dealing, these things are coming from. It's it not is anthropocentric. What it is. Yeah, it's not. It is what it is, and it's not anthropocentric. It doesn't have right? the same things that you know. You can you yep. can handle a spider, and it'll be totally cool with you and whatever until it's and, not. Until it's not, and then you get bit. You know, mm -hmm. snakes. Like you can handle a snake, it's totally cool with you, or it's not. It, dogs, every dog is different, right? Like I've got three dogs. Uh, one of our large dogs, super nice, the sweetest, just absolutely, just so sweet. Our other dog, very sweet for most of the time. Something clicks in his head, and he's not sweet at all, and he's incredibly dangerous. Mm -hmm. So you know, it's like um, we can handle him. We would never put him around anybody else because we don't know. Like we know his signs, and we know mm -hmm. what his thing is. And so, um, and that that wasn't training. Like we didn't we didn't train him in you know bite work or anything like that. Like that was just that's him, you know. And it's just a different mm -hmm. personality. And then it, expand that out to these unknown areas where you know you don't quite know what the perspective is that it's coming from you know uh, and it makes me it makes me sad that in this current uap revival that we don't get deeper into it that we don't get deeper into these questions about ourselves you know and what are our perspectives that we're bringing to this thing what are our biases you know well because like mm -hmm. everything that always happens in this country it got hijacked by people that want to monetize it yeah yeah well, really and also what people who like, are... every time something emerges, like it gets hijacked by these like Lou Elizondo type people that, mm -hmm. as far as I'm concerned, really just want to monetize it. Well, it's interesting though, because like Lou, uh, yeah, Lou's... he's a 50 50 character. For he's me. a 50 50 character. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't isn't know. he being like acted yeah, as like a pro Trump guy, isn't he now? Was yeah, the, but or was yeah. He, is he interviewed but, by Trump Jr. or something like that? Yeah, he, he was. was. Yeah, but that's Jr. that's that's a difficult thing with military folks. That's in the United yeah. States. That's difficult to make a judgment on that with military yeah. folks because um, the, both sides are bad in terms of. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not even judging him on his politics or anything. I'm no. just saying, like, uh, looking at his actions and what's happening is like it seems to me like there's, you know, some of it is. Some of it's like, oh, cool, like you know, like he was in some kind of program and he and he spoke up, cool, yeah. you know, uh, kind of like Snowden, cool that he did that. Um, mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, like other things he's done, it's like, eh, yeah. Like, well, what's he that, if, you, if you can't say what I always say the is, word, don't say anything about it. I always say the phrase threat narrative around him. What does that actually yeah. mean? It's what the, the threat. So, what is it? So. Um, if you want funding in the United States for <laughs> research that that isn't yeah. necessarily the the uh, well any research, if you want funding and you want good funding and you want a decent amount of money, 
um, the easiest be and the best way to get it is to make it weaponized and yeah. to get it get money right. from DARPA or one of the other uh, uh, venture capital groups. DARPA is not or or to hang but, a threat sign around the neck yeah, and say like I sign. have a strategy against this right. threat. Right, and that's yeah. the only way to get it. So, like, what is Congress going to take seriously? Yeah, Congress Congrats. is not going to take seriously the idea that oh, there's some non-human intelligence that wants to communicate with us and it's it's visiting us and what I don't who cares, right? But if you say, hey, mm-hmm. there's a non-human intelligence and it could be dangerous and it could be a national security thing and look, it's it's over our nuclear sites and look, it's over our, you know. Um, you know, it's it's affecting our, our training uh, situation. Like we need funding to figure out what this is. That yeah. is something that Congress will look at. And then you get the funding and the people. Cause every, I mean, whether it's, it's like big pharma, right? Or the military. And then mm-hmm. if you're anything outside of that, then it's entertainment, right? The only way you're gonna fund it is if you have a show like Skinwalker Ranch and a, a hyper rich guy that's sitting behind with the money to actually do the science. So you can all mm-hmm. see like patronage, right? Like so Bigelow, but then even Bigelow's gotta go to the threat narrative to get the money to keep doing what he's doing. So it's, you know- Or the um, entertainment narrative. Or the entertainment narrative. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or I, you know, IP, like ex- ex- extreme IP. So the other thing that they're doing is like, you see a lot of stuff around quantum computing and a lot of stuff around AI, um, because that's where money is being pushed. Cause, but, and, but those, both of those things are also weaponized. So like, you can't really, um, and so, and Elizondo coming from his background, you know, the people who've come forward in this current push have all been people from, well, not all, but uh, a large portion of them have been people from the military intelligence or, uh, you know, that kind of domain. Like, like right. Grush and people like that. Yeah. yeah, Grush, exactly. And so, you know, that's the that's the framework that they're coming from. And there, there is a legitimate, there's a legitimate argument for it if you're in those domains. My, like, the way I feel about it is, like, I'm a citizen and I don't, I'm not in those domains, you know, so... Mm. If the aliens are going to try to stop, you know, or nine human intelligence, UFOs, whatever, are going to try to stop a nuclear war, okay, uh, that's that's fine, you know. Like, did they kill people? Are they killing people? Are they doing something bad? I don't know. I don't, you know. There's there's there are within the military information too. There's also people who have been affected and have been negatively affected by this stuff. Um, you get into the mix though. Then is this just a, a an advanced weapon system that's been developed? You know, and so mm-hmm. it's 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 very confusing. A lot of it, though, does really come down to, uh, but funding. I mean, funding and and getting the right people interested in it. You got to have a you got to have something at yeah. state. You know? And if you want if you want funding and if you want government um, to pay attention to this, you right. have to come at it. You have to present it such as this seems to be, and and this is not an incorrect conclusion, but you would present it as. This seems to be some sort of observation that's going on by somebody yeah. that's not us. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's as much as you have to say. Yeah, and then you can probably get some people that find out what it is. There's some people that have a real. I've noticed from because I I'm more the occult world than the UAP world, although they're kind of you know in my opinion crossed over quite heavily at times. But um, not publicly. There does seem to yeah. be a group. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there does seem yeah. to be. Um, uh, different groups of people that are interested in ufos for different reasons there's something i've noticed yeah. and there seems to be a whole group of people that get real harm for the kind of military backed ufo mm-hmm. stuff isn't there then yeah and to me to me that's the least interest in uap stuff often yeah i don't know why i it's yeah it's kind of it seems like all the kind of interesting stuff like it, like diana's stuff's kind of interesting mm-hmm. um you know, well and you, and you still, you still you yeah. still got people that are grasping to the nuts and bolts and the extraterrestrial conclusion, yeah. and, and and at this point, I don't see why there's no, no reason to, 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 to no. grasp to hang on to that. But but they're going to hang on to it because they can't make the next step, which is but this is the, something the that's been that's here weird, though. that's been here for a long time. The UFO, the U, I still call it UFO, the UFO kind of community used to always distrust government. That was the big yeah. thing with it, right? The kind yeah. of yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, why yeah. all of a sudden, when the government come out, people from the government come out, why all of a sudden do they trust them? What's the what's the well? It's a it's a it's a shift. Like uh, we've talked about this before. Like mm-hmm. this whole thing that we're talking about in like even in the eighties was basically 
you know, like housed in the realm of the counterculture, kind of, kind mm-hmm. of the lefties, like, like the people that yeah. were into the UFO, like the people that, that introduced me to that whole thing. Like I got into UFOs when I was really, really young. Cause I was reading the books that were coming mm-hmm. out during the flap in the seventies. I'm that old. And then in the eighties, all the people that I was talking to that were interested in that were from the left. Yeah. There's like mm-hmm. the same people that were telling me these bizarre uh, conspiracy theories about Kennedy mm-hmm. assassination still in the eighties. People yeah, yeah. still going on about that. Like, you know, like, um, we're also introducing me to things from the UFO world that were like, well, if, if we if we really look at this, this, this is some sort of new energy that we could like, you know, like if we could develop this or, or backwards engineered or figure it out, then we wouldn't have to rely on big oil. And like yeah. people were thinking that. Yeah. In the the, 80s. Yeah. The, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was yeah, about the alternative that, energy. It was like all the anti-gravity, yeah. The, all the anti-gravitics yeah. and all that. Yeah, it was yeah. all that stuff was like, how do we get out from under the yoke of big energy? Yeah. And also Which, like, and the government knows what's going on more than they're telling us, so don't trust them. And that's it. Mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting though, because like, it, it, but you have like Kehoe, right? Like Kehoe and, and NICAP. Yeah. Every, like all the people associated with NICAP were, were military or, or intelligence. Yeah. You had Hill and Cotter, the former uh, head of the CIA. Um, you, you know, Kehoe was, um, he was in deep with a lot of that stuff. You had, so it it now gets, fr- our, the way we look at the military and everything gets framed differently, but these narratives, or even the anti-gravity narrative, right? Like if you look on the back end of who was driving that kind of stuff, it always had connections to uh, the military. I mean, like the SRI stuff, right? Like that was all military. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, like Bob Lazar was right? kind like of military, you, wasn't he? Well, he's well, allegedly, I'm, like, yeah, allegedly. He was a to, contractor. Like, yeah, mm-hmm. contractor. But mm-hmm. you, you mentioned Valet as somebody standing outside of this. Not at all. He's a he's a venture mm-hmm. capitalist. He worked for SRI. Mm-hmm. He worked for Institute for the Future. Um, he's very yep. in deep with the, with yep. the, the military intelligence yep. establishment. Oh, and okay. so um, it was just a different framework. Now, what we're, from the public perspective of what we were getting, a lot of that was funded by organized crime, the popular media stuff, right? You think Omni Magazine. Omni Magazine was amazing. It was funded by, mm-hmm. uh, what's his name? Guccione. Yeah. Right. So it was mm-hmm. organized crime and porn. Uh, yeah. That's where the money for that. It was money laundering, right? Yeah, like penthouse. Just, yeah, penthouse. So like you, you, the, he needed to launder money and here's an easy opportunity to launder money. You make a magazine and bill it, you know, um, ESP magazine and uh, official UFO magazine. Those were done by uh, one of like the godfather of official If you look at the people writing the articles for the for this for this like so if you look at Penthouse, um, Omni, and High Times, mm-hmm. right? I knew people that wrote for all three of those. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it was yep. it was like a, a triad. <laughs> yeah, and they were and and those and those same people were connected to like Michael uh, Berdio in Chicago, like the groups that he was exactly. kind of involved with. They and were, it was they all were, they were know. connected to the Esalen people. Like it yeah. was like it, yep. all it was all like I knew people that like that that was the circle. Yeah, yeah. and Esalen was but, doing. Going back uh, to my point though, like what what was the why is it why is it when it's reported everywhere that we, we have less trusting government than we've ever had in the Western world. Why, when the government, but do we, <laughs> these government people come out, but do yeah. we, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Well, because the, so. the government, so you could, well, think you about, say, I mean, think you have, I mean, you have left time. professed trust in the government, but do we, mm-hmm. what, what do our actions speak that we really have less? Actually, that's a, that is a good point. Because yeah. if you think about, if you think about COVID and the way we responded yeah. to the government's advice, then I suppose actually maybe we do trust the government. Yeah. Yep. Time well, it, um, uh, yeah. Yep. And also think about the narrative that's coming out, right? Whistleblowers. So mm-hmm. Lou Elizondo isn't someone who trusts the government framed in the media, mm-hmm. right? Like he's somebody who doesn't trust it, who came out mm-hmm. and sacrificed his career in order to bring the truth that not not necessarily a malicious government structure was holding, but an incompetent government structure mm-hmm. was holding and couldn't handle. And so he's coming out to reveal that, a grush, right? Whistleblower, right. Right? Uh, like really high up in the the pentagon structure and in the intelligence structure he comes out he's re- 
feeling that they're they are doing stuff that's kind of screwy and that they're not quite handling it right you know so there's that element of distrust in these people coming forward and presenting hey the government's screwing up this way right christopher mellon you know uh assistant uh, deputy director for uh national intelligence i think or the odni uh mm -hmm. you know so like he's um coming forward and saying we have this problem with these drones that are swarming over nuclear sites that are swarming over uh you know weapons test sites and the rest of it and the government the military is not handling it correctly they're not mm -hmm. doing everything they can do so all of the narratives that are coming out from these people are that the government uh is failing and you know so they play into that distrust narrative uh while also still representing and being tied into the structures that they're critiquing, you know. So, uh, well, I mean, let's let's remember what kind of got this ball rolling was the Podesta emails, which didn't have yeah. anything to do with UFOs yeah. when it got released, had yeah. to do with Hillary Clinton, and right. he just happened to be in that milieu, and right. his emails got out, and everybody went, "Wait, what is this shit about UFOs?" Right. Like every, those like, Podesta what? files have got a lot to answer for, man. I, I'm, <laughs> I've been looking, I've been looking into like the. Um, the kind of history of why conspiracy theorists think Hillary Clinton is a Satanist. Um, yeah. and it all links back to the Podesta files. They, honestly, that's the yeah. earliest. Yeah. I've, I've, I've done my research on this. The earliest mention of um, Hillary Clinton being a Satanist um, is directly linked to uh, Marina Abramovich. And, yeah, yeah, um, Abramovich, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah and, and an email message in the Podesta files and, and a misinterpretation of one of her pieces of, of work. Yeah. It's a fascinating Spirit story. Cooking. And you can... Yes. Yeah, spirit cooking. And you can you can kind of um track it. You can track it like in well, you can go on archive.org and go look at old yep. articles and stuff. You can just yep. see you can see all oh, going back to this one wiki yep. file that yep. misinterpreted some from the Podesta files. Yep. But those Podesta yep. files, man, they turn up in everything, don't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah so that's well, what I, mean, I said. Yeah. If we if we go all the way back, the ball really started rolling publicly when when mm -hmm. that got out and it yeah. wasn't even intended as no. a ufo uap related leak it was like mm -hmm. there was this guy who was attached to hillary clinton whose emails got out and then people started looking through them and going wait what yeah like and, ufos and that actually screwed up a timetable because that was the people that were working with tom delong you know tom delong was looped into yeah. those emails yeah. and um it it screwed everything up and they had yep. to they had to re reframe things and, and do all sorts of stuff. And it's interesting too because, um, and I've mentioned this before. And and again, this is I just really wish that the narratives like that we could step into a more nuanced viewing of these things. And you know, I say that, and obviously everybody needs to pick up their own ball or whatever. But just get away from this like rehash of the newest news and whatever. But um, Jacques Vallée in two thousand thirteen gave a talk about impossible futures at TEDx Geneva, where he specifically mentions the, the cases that would go into the New York Times a piece by Leslie Keen and Ralph Blumenthal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, the, he specifically, meant, he's, got the, he's got a little radar thing. He's talking about the Pentagon saw this stuff and they didn't know what it was. And we'll see in a couple of years what that means, right? So he's he's directly referencing this in 2013, which is you know a little bit after Bigelow had gotten a hold of uh, I forget which specific whether it was the gimbal or whatever, but he had been told about it and had been investigating it. So here's Valet in a TEDx talk, you know, telling that this is this is right there, this is going to happen, and then it's not until 2017, and that's because of the Podesta leak, because that mm -hmm. screwed up that timetable where it was going to. Um, you know, start to go and, and Cl the Clinton administration was working on finding a way to investigate and start to talk more about this stuff. Um, you know, that was the idea that she would come in and, and kind of start to maybe spearhead it. Who knows if, if she had gotten in, if that would have gone anywhere. But um, yeah. it did push the timetable back a little bit and, and re had to reframe things, you know. So um, I know that there's a... Um, there was Jeremy Corbell uh, had said that, you know, at the, the upcoming hearings, um, this Immaculate uh, Constellation program will be talked about if the whistleblowers' names don't get leaked. So, you know, there's this like play about like, if the information comes out too early, we gotta, we gotta pull it back and we can't like go there, you know, and it, it's happened a couple times where 
Um, and I'm not saying that's true what Corbell said, but you know, I mean, that's just this, the narrative or whatever, but it's happened a couple of times where people have been trying to push for stuff and then whatever the real world, you know, mixes around and, and it kind of washes it away. This is, mm-hmm. you know, and it was happening in the nineties with uh, the Rockefeller uh, initiative to, to look into stuff, which is where we get this revamp of Roswell, um, that Roswell um, Showtime, was it Showtime who did that Roswell movie? Yeah. Yeah. The yeah that Roswell movie comes out because Rockefeller at that time was pushing to get information on Roswell. They they saw Roswell as the case that you could if you got the information on it, you could see sort of how this information travels through the government, where what the files look like, and whether or not it was true. You would have a framework for getting more of this information out. So they targeted Roswell as being something that they were going to dig into. Um, and again, mm-hmm. because of the politics and because of the real world and everything, that just sort of washed away. And because well, we th- those are... documents disappeared. Yeah, I you know, and I think that I think they were. It's interesting because there's a lot of word games, right? Like if you read the a lot, there's there are two reports that the Air Force put out, but there's also a book that came out from the guy who wrote the reports um, for I don't know if he was he was uh, yeah he was Air Force uh, Office of Special Investigations, and so he Army was the Air, one Army Air Force, um, the AFO, was it, the, yeah Ro- was, Roswell Roswell was oh, pre Air Force no Air Force. this is yeah but this is this is recent this is afterwards like, this is, okay yeah this okay, is yeah. the the government had these there's these Air Force reports there's a oh, okay. an Air Force report and then there's a there's a Pentagon report on Roswell that came out mm-hmm. and Rockefeller was pulling strings to get this done but it was so disruptive to the things because what happened was was the request comes in and it gets sent to the different agencies who've got to find the files and do all the rest of it right and so they're like oh shit like we got to look for UFOs like i don't we don't have time for that like we got real world things going on this is bullshit like this is going to yeah. be a ton of time to look into yeah. and so they usually are like okay we'll we'll do our jobs cuz we've been told to do it but this came in as a special request from a senator which meant like you're going to get your career is over if you don't fulfill this request and you need to fulfill it on time and you need to fulfill it well. Well, the request also had gone to another agency that was supposed to do this. So they were competing to get these reports out. And the requests in those situations are very specific. People get pissed off because like, oh, they said there was nothing in the FOIA or whatever. Well, if you don't ask the question right, yeah, they are. They, it's a bureaucracy. Like they're not. You have to. Like, you have to no, document title, document, document name, title, number. document name, yeah. and yeah, yeah, or a specific phrase. Like you need yep. the exact yep. thing yep. that you're looking for. Yep. And so, when that request goes through and it says, you know, whatever the files that are related to X Y Z, yeah, well, the files that are relevant that you're looking for may not be labeled like that. They may be, you know, a code name that you don't know. They may be something yeah. you don't know. This is a very specific line of inquiry. And then they released the report based on the tasking that they'd been given. And that it showed that there was there were no documents, right? Like there was nothing to show that this was anything other than yeah. uh, a secret, uh, you know, a, a mistaken Blue, balloon yeah. program, right? And those were what the documents said. They were tasked to find documents. That's what the documents said. So, you know, people get pissed and it's like, oh, it's a cover up. Like, no, it's bureaucracy. You know, it's bureaucracy. Mm-hmm. And maybe there's people manipulating that bureaucracy, but or maybe not. Or maybe not. And Rockefeller was manipulating the bureaucracy by spurring a senator because he knew that that would get this thing pushed forward. And that caused ill will where they're like, fuck you. We don't want to be digging into this. I've got a job to do. And I'm not, I don't, my job's not to look for UFO crap, you know, and people, you, people get upset by that. But like, if they were, you know, I mean, it's the way the bureaucracy works. That's, that's how it works, you know, which is why citizen involvement and outside involvement from away from the government stuff is so important. Go out and find, you go out and find the experiencers, go out and find the experience, go and track that, do science, do empirical science and stop worrying about what the file from 19, wherever said, because you're never going to get an answer that way. It's always going to be confusing. It's always going to be skewed. You're going to find something that looks amazing. And then when the FBI releases the file on the particular general or whoever you think is the the person who revealed it in this memo, right. uh, it's going to turn out that the FBI had been investigating that guy because they were, you know, in deep with the communists at the time or that they were right. known liars or that they were just trying to progress their career or something. I mean, there's always the human element in this stuff. So you've got fallible humans and a gamey bureaucracy. And between the two, you're never going to find it. You, we need more people 
with again just a nuanced kind of view going out and actually seeking the experience seeking the the thing we're looking for and not the paper trail that leads to it and there's so many people on like x that are just obsessed with foias yeah. and they're just obsessed with you know documentation and documents and oh this proves and they're building on it they it tricks you into think that you're getting somewhere you're not getting somewhere until you're standing in front of a ufo or a non-human intelligence mm -hmm. is communicating with you like you have not you haven't found the grail you can find whatever piece of paper you want like you can be told whatever you want by anybody and unless you have that experience it doesn't it's not going to mean anything you're going to die and have never had found the truth you know or even gotten close to it well this is why foia uh, responses are so cya language yeah like they won't say we don't have it right right they, they, because they don't know if they don't have it right it's right. like we didn't we didn't find it that time right based on the criteria you gave us it, it yeah. didn't show up it didn't but show they up. won't say we don't have it because right. they very well may have it yeah it's just saying, yeah because it... you did not you did not structure the query properly right like right. it's like bayesian <laughs> yeah exactly that's exactly you know, it's yeah if you don't send it the right query it's going to yeah. return garbage <laughs> yeah and it, it it's interesting too because now that we have ai uh, and natural language programming and stuff like that. The FOIA requests are getting more nuanced. Yeah. So it's a kind of interesting parallel between the fact that people are required, you know, through searching and doing all the rest of it to start to learn how to frame within that, like, that logical yeah. structure yeah. of getting an information that people are framing FOIAs that are coming up with more in-depth information because right. they're trained on search modalities, which they hadn't been in the past. There were some right. masters of FOIA in the 80s that were, were just amazing with being able to, to query one thing, figure out some information through that, have a conversation with somebody and then start to triangulate and, and get restructure into and get, the query, restructure yeah. the query and get it, you know, to the point where there was this one guy that's mentioned in the, the Roswell report. Um, uh, well, I'm sorry, he's mentioned in the book by the guy who did one of the Roswell reports for the air force, who, uh, the guy, really was frustrated with this researcher because he was so good, but he had such respect for him because the researcher would get to the point where he would know exactly what the document was he was looking for. He didn't have the document, but he would have triangulated to the point where he would know exactly what he was looking for. And he would say, I saved you the time of digging. Here's my request. I need this document from this date, mm -hmm. this, this mm -hmm. you know, like number mm -hmm. or whatever, and, and send exactly. that to me. You know, and so like that, you know, versus just sort of like broad, broad things. I don't know if, um, what's his name? Uh, is it Greenwald? Is Greenwald the, um, John Greenwald, the guy who does the Black Vault? You know, I don't know if he's gotten to that level of like mastery of the FOIA thing, but he seems uh, appreciated as well amongst the folks mm -hmm. who've got to deal with that stuff. He tries to, to make it uh, easy on respects respects the job of the the poor archivist or whoever's got to dig into the the request <laughs>